प्रेजेंटेड बाय ईबिक्स कैश हर खुशी के लिए काफी है हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द बिजनेस टुडे शो आई एम योर होस्ट उदयन मुखर्जी over the last couple of episodes we've showcased two of india's biggest entrepreneurs one of course is byju rabindran who runs india's largest or with the world's largest edtech company and is india's biggest unicorn in after the last valuation exercise the second was uday kotak who's today the world's richest banker so would you be disappointed if i told you that today's guest is actually a school dropout maybe you won't if i also told you that this school dropout also happens to be india's youngest billionaire that's right my guest today on the show is nikhil kamath co-founder and ceo of zerodha broking india's number one stock broker they started it just a few years back and today they are the biggest in the stock broking business nikhil it's a pleasure to have you on the show with me thanks again uh, lovely to be here thank you guys for having me uh, i have to say uh, to preface our conversation Sorry. i've been a big fan of you for uh, over 15 years now and have been watching you on tv and uh, remember so many instances uh, what comes to mind you know is like the satyam day when you were talking about satyam i was trading the satyam stock and uh, many many memories of having watched you and uh, have have always been in awe of you so big fan here hey thank you so much nikhil those are very kind words but you are the star today you know yes. uh, you, you you as i said i mean you dropped out of school and you probably bumbled your way around a little bit and look where you are today a billionaire how does it feel to be a billionaire in your mid mid 30s well uh, udyan it's one of those things uh, which i mean it sounds good at the very beginning but i think it uh, it also has its pluses and minuses not something we pay attention to too much uh you know we are paper billionaires so it's a it's a valuation metric of somebody multiplying how much profits your company make in a year into x uh so don't really pay too much uh, heed to it and uh, we are very cognizant to the fact that we're in such a cyclical business where uh, you know at any point the markets can correct 30 40% and be in a bear a uh, bear run for a couple of years and uh, we lose 50% of our revenue instantly so uh, it, it is it is nice and it is uh, complimentary to all the hard work many people have put in uh, and uh, yeah has it changed your life though nikhil significantly because you know i i read somewhere that you like fast cars you drive big bikes uh ha- has life changed or, or do you re- remain a fairly regular kind of guy well i think fairly regular uh, when i was younger there there was a time when i bought one bike and a car but uh, uh, not any more and also i live in bangalore udyan so uh, it's in my mind uh, the traffic in bangalore is probably <laughs> you know on par with delhi or even worse so you don't really have the opportunity to drive a car here and really enjoy it uh, so not really and i'm I'm kind of now working from home so I don't even get out of the house you know unless it's like once in a week or once in 10 15 days any regrets about the dropout bit nikhil i want to ask you because you know sometimes you you become successful but you look back and say maybe i could have gone to college maybe it would have meant something do you ever feel like that or you think it was the right time right decision at that time you meet people and you hear stories about how Uh, the best friendships they had and the best times of their life were in college and uh, when you do when you hear that you do feel like maybe you missed out on uh, an experience in life which so many people cherish so much but i do want to just address the zero the bit because this has been a remarkable success that you've pulled off what did you think what do you think you've done differently uh, compared to the existing model which was in place for many years the u- usual icici directs and hdfc securities of the world how could you shake up the systems quite so easily and do you think you'll manage to keep your edge in a fairly competitive space yeah so when we began our biggest usp was transparency and uh, the fee structure of course uh, we were traders back then both me and nitin and uh, we had to pay as much as 
uh, half a percent in brokerage and still have a fairly shoddy service uh, where you didn't really know what your broker was charging and why. Uh, so uh, at the very beginning, the cost advantage, the fact that we charged uh, a 20 rupee flat fee versus somebody who was charging half a percent, uh, it made a bigger difference on derivatives where people were speculating because they were speculating with leverage and uh, this half a percent on a levered product, uh, people ended up paying more money than they make trading in just brokerage. Uh, so the timing of it all, I would say, uh, was a huge help. Uh, we started in 2009, 2010, uh, just after the financial crisis in the West where uh, very little uh, was happening around fintech and very little money was chasing fintech. Uh, but outside of that initial impetus, and I think uh, kudos to Nitin for having, uh, I still remember he used to sell each account individually one by one. And uh, the big transition for us ha happened when Kailash joined the business and we became more of a tech player. And we moved towards uh, uh, building technology around broking and I think that has become the differentiator for us today. But how will you stay ahead Nikhil because you know there are now players who are trying to do what you're doing up stocks grow and how do you build moats around this business uh, because you know tomorrow somebody with capital might come in say a Bajaj Finance launches a, a snazzy app throws a couple of thousand crores at it and tries to take you on at your game. How do you keep your leadership uh, in the face of uh, all these challengers? Yeah, so if I were to be a bit candid there, Udyan, I mean, there are people who are, uh, you know, funded today in the ecosystem who are probably spending a hundred times more money than us in uh, be it acquiring clients or marketing. Uh, I feel what has worked for Zeroda along the years is the ethos has been very different. Uh, I don't think uh, Zeroda has ever tried to acquire too many clientele uh, very quickly and uh, we've never spent money or done any advertising or marketing. Uh, so considering the fact that we've been around for 11 years and uh, uh, to, a, to a large extent we have uh, dealt with the stockbroking business with a lot of transparency, uh, I'm hoping it has built up a certain amount of credibility and loyalty amongst all the many investors who have backed us and supported us over the last uh, decade and more. Uh, but yeah, every everybody's competition, every new guy who comes in is uh, competition in one way or another. Uh, uh, if, if I were to like uh, give you my own personal opinion, I think every uh, company has a life cycle. Uh, there are uh, bull runs in a company and bear runs in a company. There will probably be a time when uh, we are not the most efficient company out there or we are not changing as much as our competition. Uh, but the onus lies on us to, you know, kind of realize that uh, there are better people out there in the market at that point of time and uh, look within, recharge, uh, come back with uh, new stuff and uh, be competitive again. But I think it is cyclical and uh, that cycle probably holds true for, you know, uh, all the companies out there. But if I were to ask you, how many discount brokers can a system support? Uh, uh, do you think it's inevitable that maybe only two or three people at the top will get most of the loyal active customers? The others will probably struggle to be profitable. Could it evolve into that kind of a paradigm over time? The ecosystem is really tiny in India. Uh, the, the equity participation might have gone up from one and a half percent of our population uh, to maybe 2% or a little bit above that today. Uh, but it all depends on, you know, how long this bull run lasts for and uh, does the ecosystem grow significantly? Uh, if that penetration number went from 2 to, say, 4 or 5 or 6%, I'm sure there's plenty of room for uh, discount brokers out there, you know, more brokers coming into the ecosystem. When we started this show a few minutes ago, you spoke about valuations and you almost spoke about it with a dismissive air. It's interesting that you guys have a billion dollar plus valuation but you're, nor are you, do you seem to be in a hurry to raise any capital, maybe you don't need to, or to get some kind of a listing to endorse that you have a certain valuation or use that as currency in any way. Is it something which does not excite you, this whole let's do an IPO, let's get a valuation, let's be worth a few billion dollars. 
neither you nor your brother think like that do you doesn't excite us also if uh, if i were to be candid here again i think uh, we're in such bubble territory not just in india across the world uh, that you know everybody and anybody with an idea scribbled on a piece of paper seems to be raising money uh, the valuations of many of the companies which went public recently uh, i would never bet on them at at that multiple uh, i think we have we have arrived at a ecosystem in the public markets and the private markets where uh, it's not about how profitable a company is or uh, what value you're actually buying into people are not researching a company that they intend to buy and hold for the long term but it has become more that my friend bought a company at 100 it went to 150 he sold it so i will do the same it, it does not even matter what the underlying business is uh so i'm a big bear on uh, valuations both private and public and uh, to not participate in that euphoria is probably uh, also part of also in a way how we feel about valuations and the entire ecosystem today so you are not exactly a big fan of how zomato got listed and the price or the market cap of a 1 lakh crores plus that it trades at today you wouldn't be buying it in a hurry would you uh no then i wouldn't i uh, i have tried to value zomato in a dozen different ways uh, i have looked at their future cash flows the spending power of uh, retail public in india uh, relative com- competition in china and america which have bigger margins and are growing faster uh, whatever i do i don't think i can arrive uh, at the decision of buying it at 130 rupees today you would go as far as to say that there is a bubble in the ipo market today in india i think so i think so uh, i i was talking to somebody recently and uh, uh, there's a funny anecdote but uh, a client of ours was applying for uh, rolex rings the ipo in the names of all of his fam- family members and uh, when someone asked him why he said i like the watch brand rolex and hence i am so Uh, there is total euphoria in the ipo mm. market today and i think it's scary uh, i would also say it's scary because more retail seems to be participating now and a lot of smart money is you know offloading in one manner or another fair point and i want to ask you a bit about that nikhil because you're in a good vantage point to tell me whether that is indeed the case i mean so many new demat demat accounts are being opened we hear many from b cities and c cities what do you think is the level of sophistication or level of uh, knowledge that these investors carry with them as they enter the market today uh, are you not totally sanguine about the quality of investors or new investors who are coming into the market today so for the people who have come in in the last one year i would assume a lot of them have made money uh, by virtue of the market conditions the underlying conditions have been so bullish Uh, that anybody who came and bought equity uh, looks savvy uh, looks like uh, he knows what he's doing and is sitting on a considerable profit uh, one can i think only truly gauge how sophisticated and savvy an investor is uh, when we see how he reacts to different market cycles so i would wait for a bit of volatility maybe a bear run or two before i can actually gauge the quality of the new investors who have come into the market uh, but with hindsight uh, everybody looks savvy and right who has come in in the last 12 months you mentioned the words bear market volatility in your last answer do you see the road ahead being bumpy i mean in the next 12 to 15 months is it a possibility in your eyes that we have some kind of an accident in the stock market well i've always believed no one can really call the markets you know let, let alone me but uh, considering the up move we have had and uh, considering there are uh, so many people who have come in for the first time so much foreign capital which is in the country over the last one year uh, i feel like the odds of an accident or the odds of volatility are significantly higher than uh, maybe at any point in the last 5 6 years Uh, the pandemic was an outlier it came and hit all of us as a surprise but if you leave that aside markets have largely been fairly stable for a long time now 
uh, and if i were to wager a guess i would say yeah i think we are in accident prone territory and uh, this is probably the time to diversify reallocate take some risk off the book uh, rather than you know lever up and uh, add to a vanilla long only portfolio today my opinion It's interesting that you speak about your bearish outlook towards the world and I believe that it does not extend only to the prospects for the stock market. You seem to be a bit unhappy about how capitalism is moving along over the last few last few years. That's strange coming from someone who runs a brokerage and a wealth management firm to hear you speak about so critically skeptically about capitalism uh, makes you wonder what's going on. But, um, what what is your primary grouses against how things stand today yeah so historically when you look at it we've had our own mini cycles of you know uh, capitalism followed by socialism to maybe some form of communism maybe throw monarchy in between there somewhere uh, i think the problem uh, what history has taught us is uh, if the king of a certain kingdom had uh 70% of the wealth of the kingdom is fine if he had 80 is fine but uh, the day he has 99.9% of uh, the kingdom's wealth uh, the very next day people come show up and you know overthrow the king and uh, there is another cycle of uh, beat socialism or whatever form of governance uh history has also taught us that uh, socialism and communism have not uh, really worked uh capitalism in my understanding of history is probably the best model where uh, society has succeeded to a certain extent relative to any other form of uh, governance but uh, i think we are getting to that point where too few people have too much of the resources uh, that our country has to offer uh you know there have to be changes that are made you know it could be uh, inheritance tax for example it could be other ways of bridging this divide uh, you know but uh, it is probably sensible both for the affluent and the privileged lucky of today to understand that before it is too late because that eventuality will be both will be bad for both sides i wanted to ask you and since we are having a candid chat mm-hmm. uh, do you have a need for publicity because you know a couple of times your name has come up in the recent past for things which seem very arbitrary like you cheating in a match with vishwanath anand or you taking a 100 crore salary for yourself your uh, and your brother i mean did you on hindsight do you think that you did not play it quite right and you could have done this that differently because they seem like very avoidable kind of noise yeah no totally i think uh it's also a learning experience for me uh, uh a lot of the publicity of late has not been uh, i don't know if misrepresented is the right word but uh, there has been a lot of murk about it and i've tried to you know uh, figure out how to uh, deal with it in the best way possible but uh, hopefully you know i have had my learning from each of these instances some things were unavoidable but uh, other things were possibly avoidable and uh, in the future hopefully i'm able to avoid them you seem to be like a like a fellow who learns from his mistakes can you take me through some of the mistakes that you've made in your journey since you dropped out of school and which have actually remained with you and have taught you a lot about how to go about constructing a career a business a life yeah you know it's funny but in some small way you have been part of many of those mistakes i know it, it sounds weird when i say that but uh, like i was telling you about satyam at the very beginning of this call a uh, big mistake so the one thing i feel about the markets is whenever you get into this position uh, uh, where you feel uh, you know like you're bulletproof even to a tiny extent markets have a way of punishing you and uh, bringing you back to your senses <coughs> i think they are the biggest humbling factor in anybody's life because uh, everybody's wrong half the time and uh, right half the time so uh, I, r- i have a book where i write down when you know really stark things happen in my life uh, professionally it would have been you know an election where i was short and the market spent up 10% or the satyam day or another day when a company uh, just crashed corrected and burnt uh, 
and in a lot of these events uh, i was watching the news and you were on it so you in your own way have been part of it and where do you see yourself nikhil in 10 years time i know you're in a business where you can't predict the next 10 minutes forget the next 10 years but uh, what's what's your ambition where where would you like to see yourself professionally and personally in 10 years time so i'll do personally first uh, you know personally i i have a lot of work to do uh, on how to how to better maintain interpersonal relationships uh, at different times i've paid more importance to maybe work or the markets and ignored a lot of what i should be doing you know it could be with my parents it could be with a partner of mine i would like to change that someday i think uh, that part of my life has been grossly neglected in one way or another uh i would i have always fascinated having a bit more of a nomadic life uh i feel like there is so much to be learned by meeting people uh, being in different cities uh, actually physically interacting with many people uh, so i'd love to you know have maybe two homes in two different countries and split my time there and that way you know it, it hopefully broadens my horizons and uh, makes me aware of more opportunities across the world Hey it's been a pleasure talking to you Nikhil and thank you very much for being so candid over the last few minutes uh, um, I'm very impressed with the way you're going about your life and I'm I wish you all the best and I can see that very many very good things much greater things lie ahead for you thank you very much for your time it's been a pleasure talking to you thank you so much Adi thank you Bye. that was Nikhil Kamath of True Beacon and Zerotha well We'll have another inspiring individual from the world of business next week again. I'll give you a hint. He's one of the world's biggest entrepreneurs. Yes, one of the world's, not India's. But I won't give away much more than that. Um, so I'll see you next week. Till then, this is Uday Mukherjee signing off on the Business Today show. Enjoy your weekend. Have fun.